your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people just like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. If you're seeing me for the first time, I started this show on March 20th when the sheltering in place began to create a sense of community and connection with my private group. I pushed the wrong button and ended up going everywhere on YouTube and Facebook, and people seem to enjoy the show and watch. So for the past 148 days, I've been going live one to three times a day with amazing and interesting guests. Those that watch live know that there's a chat feature where you can chat with each other and also ask me questions. And since the show began on March 20th, there has been one person that has been requested over and over and over by the live viewing audience. And I contacted this person and at first the answer was no, but now it's not, it's yes. She is one of the sweetest, kindest people you've ever met. She has, she really is the OG when it comes to low fat starch baked cooking. She really is, I think the person that started it. She's created thousands of recipes, co-authored many best selling books with delicious recipes that most of you can get for free on her website. She actually is the wife of a very prominent physician who's been on the show many times, Dr. John McDougall. But this show today is about her. Her name is Mary McDougall. Please welcome her to the show. Mary, I am so happy. For 10 years, I've been wanting to have you on the show. Uh, well, it's great to be here. I really, I, I just like you said, I didn't want to do it at first, but because I'm kind of a shy person, but, and I'm not <clears throat> I'm not, I wasn't made for public speaking. I was not, not, not in my uh, DNA when I was born. And uh, um, so, so for me to, to do a show, um, it, it takes me a while to think about it. And, um, but since it was you, um, I decided that was, it, it, since I like you so much and I have so much fun on your shows, um, uh, it's a good time for me to, to get back in here and then talk to some people and tell them about myself. Well, they, they really do so want to mind, AJ, since you guys have such a good rapport together. Why don't I just get out of here? Oh. Well, it's just that people love you too, Dr. McDougall. Well, I, they I like looking. Gonna, well, you didn't even say hello to me when we started. Oh. <laughs> it's not about <laughs> you so today. I was infatuated with Mary and the opportunity <laughs> to have her on. Uh, oh. I understand. And, uh, you know, I have nothing to say except for I want to make sure that you, you, you'll have the, you'll have a few, I'll have a few questions for you. Yeah, that's true because because one of the things is they want one of the questions was is the doc does Dr. McDougall ever make any of his own meals? No, no we'll, uh. we'll get to that in just a minute. I do want to say though that Mary and I are really busy this week, and I'll be doing redoing all of my slide presentations, and Mary's going to be participating. We're starting the twelve day uh, telemed teleeducation program which is, uh, you know, really unique. And I want to make sure that your viewers not only know about it, but spread the, uh, the good news to friends and relatives, because we're bringing our once residential program that costs close to $6,000. We're bringing that to the public with medicine, with our doctors coming into their homes. Dr. Lim will be seeing most of the people right now. Uh, we'll be starting that this Friday, which is, what is it, August? No, uh, the 21st. The 21st. Thursday. Thursday. Thursday, I think. Well, anyway, it's the yeah. 21st. We're starting on the 21st of August, 2020. And uh, the cost of the program is less than half. And uh, we're really excited about it because there was so much difficulty in people getting involved in our program in the past. Not only the cost, which I already mentioned, but also the fact that people had to travel on airplanes, had to stay with us for, <clears throat> for 10 to 12 days in Santa Rosa, California. It was very difficult. Now we're in a situation where we're gonna come to your home. Uh, our doctors are coming to your house. We'll take care of you just like they would in an office, except I think in a better situation because it will be a more equal relationship rather than you being sitting in the doctor's office under his or her command you'll be in a situation where you are in a familiar environment. And uh, the other thing that's really nice is we'll be able to take care of you ongoing. And which is really exciting is uh, our relationship one and that after 12 days, you continue to have medical care uh, from one of our doctors uh, after the program goes. So we'll be able to offer a lot, a lot of support you know, I was really excited. I'm, I'm sorry, Mary, I got to take a minute. That's okay, because I, I want to say something about okay. the program too. I, I was really excited uh, because, you know, I conveyed to Heather, Heather's our daughter, who also is the manager of the McDougall programs. Uh, <clears throat> I conveyed to her that 
you know, we have some unique things to offer that nobody else seems to offer right now. One is medical care, which is something that no one else has to offer. And uh, the other is a personal relationship. And Heather really picked that up. In fact, so much so that, you know, our meet and greet session that we used to do in the residential program, yeah. where people would come in the first night on Friday night, they'd all sit around and we'd uh, pick up an object and we'd talk about some personal things about that yeah. object. Yeah. Well, Heather has incorporated that. So the 25 to 30 people who are involved in the program, and we have a limited number of people. You get to know each other if right, you want. Right. You can remain anonymous. The 25 to 30 people that uh, are involved in the program will get to interact with each other, get to know a little bit about each other. So we're going to bring as intimate a relationship as we possibly can over the internet. And actually, in some ways, I think it's going to be much more intimate, well, much I more comfortable for people. Yes. And, and they're still going to get the, the blood pressure checks and the and and lab tests, the lab tests yeah. and all the other things they got, except that they don't have to travel they don't have and trouble. stay in a strange place. And, and, and you can uh, keep with your private doctor. It's not like you have to abandon your private doctor. Right. It will help you get specialists and the extra kind of care that you need. So you know, I can't think, it's, it's actually been a dream of mine <laughs> to be able to bring this uh, program to people in a much more uh, much more comfortable, much more effective way. And we've really done it. Oh, so August 21st. We, much easier for people. Much easier. What did you want to say about the program? All I wanted to say is they still get their blood pressure taken, that they, they still get their weigh-ins. Yeah. And um, all this stuff is recorded. And so we have medical records on them. Mm -hmm. And so they'll always be our patients. Yeah, you'll be able to have private consults with uh, Doug Lyle and Jeff Novick and probably Mary McDougall if you want to talk oh, to her. <laughs> Uh, I, Heather, think, I think Heather said something about that. Yeah. Anyway, and I'll be around too. I don't know what exactly I'll be doing, but don't you have to worry. I, I, I will be supervising everything and make sure it has the quote make Google stamp on top. And we'll keep the quality that we've always had in the past. It's all yours, Mary. Okay. There's the camera right there. <laughs> all right. Well, it sounds like an amazing program. And we have comments from people like Zena who's saying the 10-day McDougal program was the best thing that ever happened to me, yeah. saved my life, and has given me a much, much better quality of life for the past 17 years. So lots of fans of both of you and the program. So thank you. It sounds amazing. So Mary, I think yeah. you could probably guess a lot of what other questions will be. And there's a lot of cooking questions, but I got to tell you, because people that were on the mailing list wrote in, the number one question, what inquiring minds want to know is, what is it like to be married to Dr. McDougal? But what is it really like? You might as well start uh, with the early days. <laughs> when, when, you when, when you tried to cook for really, me. Or really early days. Um, well, let me start even earlier than that, because um, when I was growing up, um, you know, a lot of people learn from their moms in the kitchen and they learn how to cook and they, they take time practicing. I never did any of that. My mother was a terrible cook. She never taught me anything. Um, I really didn't know how to make very many foods. Um, you know, when I was um, by myself, living by myself, you know, I would often have a can of stewed tomatoes for dinner at night because I didn't know how to cook anything else. And I, I didn't really care all that much about cooking. Um, so for me, um, <laughs> well, was it something I said? Hopefully they'll come right back. That has happened in the past. I thank you guys for being here. I'm going to keep the broadcast going. And so they probably hit a button. Oh boy. There's so many nice comments about the McDougals. So stay tuned. Uh, of all the people to get disconnected with, I know that this often happens when I've done Australia and Canada and Great Britain. Doesn't usually happen in the United States. So um, let me text them to log on again. I get to do that. I have their phone numbers. Oh, not giving it out though. So let's, uh, let me call them. Right now, oh, okay. Dun, dun. How much you give me for that phone number, huh? Wow, Vicky's down 80 pounds. Whoa, that's amazing. I'm reading the chat. I will have to entertain you until they come back. 
Well, oh, they're coming back. Yes, sir. Okay, AJ, we are back. You know, I, w- I was worried, Mary, that it was something I said that it was maybe too personal. And they said, I'm out of here. Oh, it was John trying to goof around with technology. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. Oh, that's right. No, I right. can't see that. You can't see anything but the kitchen, right? Right. Just the kitchen. Just the right. fridge. I can't see my face either. Oh, right. uh, yeah. I, you're cut off right about the chin. There you go. There I can see your whole face now. I'm right. so glad you guys. Maybe that'll be, that'll be a little better. Yeah. Okay. So, so your mom didn't teach you anything about no, cooking? No. And so uh, when we got married, um, well, and, and also I was raised in a family that, that didn't focus heavily on meat. My mom did a lot of casseroles because you could just throw those things together. And uh, they would turn out, you know, so that's what I, I was sort of raised on. And um, when John and I first met, um, I was really shocked at the way he ate. Um, I, I can still remember when we first moved in together and he told me what he wanted for breakfast and it was um, six eggs. Oh, come on. It was. Oh, six eggs, I know. It was six eggs. You don't have to tell people that. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, it was six eggs. <laughs> it was six eggs. But. Plus, plus bacon. And, yeah. and I said, you had that for breakfast? We had eggs and bacon maybe once a month for dinner. Um, because my mom didn't like to cook eggs. I never ate eggs for breakfast. We always had cold cereal. So, um, for me to, to, um, learn how to cook for John was, um, uh, interesting well, because yeah. he liked so many different things well, than, but, than I knew how to make. I was raised in a family where, you know, uh, my parents came out of the depression. They wanted to make sure that their kids didn't have to suffer like they did on turnips and potatoes. Yeah. And so they were going to give me the best of life. And of course, my parents were worried about calcium and protein, just like all your parents were. And we got plenty of calcium and protein and cholesterol and fat. And of course, most of you know I had a massive stroke when I was 18 and suffered a lot of health problems up until I changed our diet. Yeah, but, after but I married you, you. But you see, my parents, I never even heard the word cholesterol. I never heard, I never, my mother never talked about fat and, right. and calories and, and, or any of those things. So, um, it, it was all new to me. I just thought food was, you know, you went to the grocery store and you bought what you liked and you, you, if, if you didn't have to cook it, it was great because you could eat it just plain. But if you had to cook it, it had to be really easy to cook. You want to tell them about the story where, where the oven blew up in your face? <laughs> I mean, I still remember that. We, we, we had, when we first um, moved in together, we lived in a really tiny old apartment in Grand Rapids, right? When he was still finishing medical school and we had this old oven, it must have been from the 1920s and it was a gas oven and um, you had to light it by, it didn't have a pilot light, so you had to light it by sticking a match inside the oven, you know, way in the back and um, so I must have had the oven on or the gas on too long before I stuck the match in there and it blew up. It just blew up in my face. Well, that and reflects the, the cooking, but tell them what you tried to cook. Remember? Oh, I think it was, was trying, I think it was try, a ham. Yeah, it was something big. It was either a ham or a, a big um, prime rib or something that, that something I didn't know how to cook anyway. And, but it singed all the hair off my face and my eyebrows and my eyelashes. And, um, but I didn't get burned. I just, <laughs> I just got scared. Well, so, Mary, Mary was very compliant and went along with my eating habits. She didn't eat it that way, of course. And it really shows, I mean, even when we were young and first got married, I mean, I had all kinds of significant health problems by the time we got married, which, was when I was 24 years old, you were yeah. about 25. And you know, the difference in health between the two of us, just because your parents were very conservative and uh, ate lots of casseroles, as opposed to my parents are really focused on meat and dairy yeah. and uh, you know, eggs and so on. It already showed by the time we were in our early 20s, the difference in our health. 
but you were very kind as far as not making me suffer terribly well, by giving up my favorite foods. No, I mean, I really tried it. You, when you learn how, to, when you do something for the first time, it, it never really turns out um, the way you want it to. And so you have to keep practicing. So I, I practiced. Uh, making these things, and I learned how to make eggs and bacon and all the stuff that, that we don't eat anymore. Right. <laughs> well, let's, you know, maybe just to, unless you have another thought about something that happened significant in the interval, maybe they'd like to hear about how I was such a pest about getting <laughs> you to change the family diet. I, yeah, I was in my uh, internal medicine residency. And I was going to the library. I developed this passion for scientific studies. Now, prior to that, I have to tell you, prior to my discovery of the importance of food, which I discovered, as many of you know, on the plantation, I had no interest in the scientific literature. I'd probably read about five scientific papers. You know, that's, I, had, I had a good memory, and I read my textbooks. That's how I passed my tests. But uh, once I made the connection between diet and poor health or good health based on my plantation experiences, I went back into residency and then I started going to the library and I discovered that I didn't have an original thought, that all of the things that I'd observed as far as the cause and cure of disease and much more, I learned so much more, had already been published in the scientific literature. And I couldn't believe uh, how this gold mine of information had been ignored and how it dealt with basically all the problems I dealt with as an internist. And I was excited because this really gave me a power play. I knew more than my colleagues did. So I would come home and I would tell Mary about the new things that I discovered. And I believed him, but- <laughs> That's the first mistake. <laughs> I believed what he was saying, but I didn't see how I was going to fit this into our meal plan because um, he would come home and say, we can't eat red meat anymore. And I'd say, fine, I didn't know like to cook it anyway. And then he'd come home and he'd say, oh, we can't eat pork or chicken or any animals um, because they have just as much cholesterol and fat and, and everything else. And so I, I, had, I had, at that time, I had learned how to cook chicken, I think. So that was a big one. I had to figure out what to cook instead of chicken. But you see, I well, still well, know. First, I still, you, you've got to tell them. First, I came home and told you that white meat was better than red meat. Yeah. So you had to go from beef and ham to chicken and fish, which we hated. We hated fish. Yeah, but it, that didn't last very long. No. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he would read all the time. So he'd come home. Um, one week and it was red meat we had to give up and two weeks later it, he'd come home and it was well we can't eat white meat either um and then um a few weeks later it was well we can't eat eggs well people need to understand you know muscles and muscles and muscle and so if it happens to flap a wing or you know move a limb or wiggle a fin they're all muscles yeah i know but and i did. discovered but i discovered that by researching that the impact of various muscles on blood cholesterol was basically the same. Uh, so I said, Mary, we've got to give up the chicken and fish. Well, but you see, but, he, you, you didn't really tell me all the whole story. Well, it was just, you know, we, we can't eat this and we can't eat this because I have to tell my patients what they have to do to get better. And if I'm still eating this stuff, I can't really tell them. That's right. And no, so I, I couldn't speak beyond my own dinner plate, which is a real problem for most of the experts you hear out there. If you hear them recommending oh, a little chicken, a little fish, a little olive oil, etc., it's because they can't get beyond their own dinner plate. They can't see the truth beyond their own dinner plate. So I realized that I had to change our family diet or I couldn't tell you what to do. So that's why I came home and I said, Mary, please help. I have to learn to eat this way. Otherwise, I can't ask other people to eat that way. Well, luckily, um, he didn't discover that cheese was not bad for a couple of months. So we ate a lot of cheese, yeah. a lot of cheese dishes. Remember back in the early 70s, there were a lot of vegetarian cookbooks out there, and they all focused on cheese. You, you made a regular dish, and then you put a lot of cheese on it, and then it made it taste better or something. 
So in the beginning, we ate, maybe for two months, we ate cheese. Yeah. Um, well, the transition was pretty quick. Yeah. It was painful, though, folks. I don't, want you, <laughs> I don't want you to think that this was easy. And the main thing was giving up the salt. You know, when you switch from beef and pork to chicken to fish, you load the same old sauces and salt shakers on. When you switch to cheese, what you do is you, you switch to a very high salt product. And that's the way they get you to eat cheese or any other dairy product is loaded with salt or sugar. Otherwise, it's too disgusting. So we had the salt, which is the main thing people miss. And then I told you, Mary, dairy is liquid meat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the big one. Yeah, the cheese, you, then it was um, oil. Yeah, when, he to, when he told me that I couldn't cook with oil anymore. Well, but you do cook with oil for a while. I cooked with oil for a while, but not for long. And then I told you that oil causes heart disease, obesity, and cancer. Yeah. So we got to give it up. So after you have to, and, and that just about did it. It just I sounds think, like you're I so. I almost lost my happy home. Uh, you know, <laughs> it was uh, uh, deservedly so. I mean, very few people would tolerate my kind of uh, obsessions. Well, especially someone who didn't know how to cook. And, but you, but you learned to cook, uh, Mary. Your food, your recipes are amazing now, and it sounds like you just went along with everything. You were so, I mean, you just. You I did, I did, I, 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 but, but I had a lot of failures. I mean, I when we got married, I didn't even know how to cook rice. Um, luckily, we moved to Hawaii, and every single store sold rice cookers, and so one of my first purchases when I, when we got to Hawaii was a rice cooker. And so at least I can cook rice because all you have to do is put it in and turn it on and it, it cooks. And then I took, um, I, I guess I looked through um, vegetarian cookbooks and I decided which ones I could adapt by leaving out the cheese and all the other stuff that, the cheese and the eggs and the stuff that we didn't eat. I didn't choose meat cookbooks, I chose vegetarian cookbooks, so at least I only had to give up the cheese and um, the oil. And But um, I think I ruined a few pans um, learning how to cook without oil. Um, I think um, a lot of the stuff didn't taste very good in the beginning. Yeah, I really when I when we got married, I probably had three or four spices in my in my cabinet, and now of course I have a whole cupboard full of spices because I know how important it is to um, make things taste good. Because if they don't taste good, you're not going to eat them. Well, let, let me interject something here. Is you know we had difficulty giving up the oil, but now, and I'm sure most of you who are listening can relate to this. If you go out to dinner and you have an oily dish. It's it's oh. unpal it's unpalatable, uh, you know. You, it's disgusting. So uh, you know, it's just a matter of ad adaptions, uh, adapting to low salt food, adapting to no oil, and then you look back and you say, well, why didn't I do this before? Now, Mary, there's one other big change that we made that you will have to think back to remember, and that was when our son Patrick developed allergies. It was oh. about, it was in our early 30s, and I said, Mary, we got to be able to help Patrick. Yeah. And uh, we made some really, go ahead. Well, we thought that because, because of some of his allergies might have been caused by gluten. So we decided we would go on a gluten-free diet for two weeks. Two weeks. Least, at least two weeks. two weeks. Maybe it was four. Two weeks. Yeah, it, it was quite a while, but it was worse. It was more oh, limited right. than that. We had only potatoes. Well, no, that was later. That, okay. well, that, that was later. This was, this was when we were trying to, to get Pat to go, go off gluten. So I had to learn how to make gluten-free recipes. And um, let me tell you, there were a lot of hard rocks that we, we tried to get through um, in the beginning. Yeah, but, but, but uh, hockey pucks for, for, <laughs> for muffins. Uh, um, these days, it's a little bit easier. They make... Um, gluten-free baking mixes and and a lot of things are a lot um easier but this was back in the 70s and there was nothing and, and just to conclude that story I, I want to tell you patrick was not allergic to wheat 
or to the you know the common things people talk about. Uh, we found out that he was allergic uh, to the environment. We were living in Manawili, uh, Oahu, and it was tucked under some mountains and it rained all the time. So we had uh, a very damp, moldy environment. Yeah. And that was the problem when we moved to the ocean, which we did a few years later, uh, then all of his allergies yeah, went away. And yeah. he, has, he really hasn't been bothered since. So, you know, I guess I add that as a cautionary tale. Don't fall into the trap of uh, thinking that it's only food allergies that could be troubling you. There may be other things that are bothering you, particularly in the environment. That's great. Yeah. So, so Mary, Dr. McDougall often tells a story that you guys met in an operating room and you had surgical masks on and could only see each other's eyes. And it was love at first sight, at least for him. For was me, it, this- it was. <laughs> what about you? I fell in love. And I want to tell you, AJ, you know, I was not an inexperienced young man. Neither was Mary inexperienced. So, uh, you know, it wasn't that we were dealing in an unknown realm of uh, true love. Uh, but <laughs> at least I had decided that I was going to be honest with myself and I wasn't going to quote fall in love or tell somebody I love them when I really didn't because I was told by my parents that I will know when true love hits. I just have to be honest with myself. So we had right. I mean, it was in the operating room and operating uh, room. and I, I met her and I fell in love immediately. I have to say it was at least, at least till after we got married, probably years after our marriage before I think she really found out what a wonderful guy I was. <laughs> <laughs> but she kept me anyways. There's one other thing that you that I think is kind of interesting. People will find it She's in the operating room. You could always tell her when I was coming. Oh, always because of his stroke, he he limped. I have a foot drop. He is like, oh okay. It's called but a foot drop. it sounded like limped me. So when when he would walk down the hall, I could I could tell when he was coming because of the way he walked, and it was so um, dramatic that. When our youngest son, Craig, um, who's 36 now, when, when he was first learning how to walk, he imitated John's walk. And so he learned how to walk with a limp. <laughs> it didn't last long, but that's how he thought you walked. Yeah. Well, anyway, so, I'm still limping at 73 yeah. years old. How long, long did it she take? She still her- loves me. <laughs> How long did it take for him to propose after meeting in the operating room? Uh, let's see. Um, it took about three weeks for me to say I would go out with him. Yeah, I, I couldn't get a date. Yeah. And I, and I pursued, you know, usually I just say, fine, let's go on to the next person. But I pursued her and it took about three weeks before she finally said yes. Three weeks before I got a date. And, and then... Um, Six weeks later. Yeah. I, 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 after we first t- Tell went, him where I proposed to you, Mary. He proposed to me in the medical library of this small hospital that we were working in. Yeah. Well, no, it wasn't that small. No, it was a Blodgett hospital. Blodgett hospital, yeah. But yeah. the library seems seemed small. Maybe it wasn't, but it seemed small. But I remember sitting on a chair next to the stack of books, and um, he proposed to me in the medical library. And um, I said, yes. I didn't even have to think about it. Yeah, well. <laughs> I did I not. I didn't think about it. I, I, I don't said know that I gave it. you any choice. <laughs> and then, it's, it's, I got to say, it's very hard to say no to Dr. McDougall. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then um, about six weeks after that, maybe two months. Well, it was probably six weeks. We got married. Yeah, we got married after that, right? In, in January. So we met in September. We probably went on our first date in October. So he probably proposed to me in November, and we got married in January, the first part of January. And how many years has it been? I'm not going to say. I'll be in trouble. I'm, I'm not going to say. It was either. 1972. We, we married in 1972, yeah, so it's 30, 40, 48 years. 40, 48, it's 48, 48 years. 48 years, yeah. That's amazing. I have to say, 50. and I know you and Charles can relate to this, uh, AJ. Uh, because I know Charles, and uh, I know that he has a similar personality to Mary's, and you have a similar personality to mine. Uh, is there not a day? I mean, every day in our marriage certainly hasn't been happy. We've had our difficulties like everybody. There's not a day I ever said to myself, boy, I think I made a mistake, or maybe I could have done better. Or, no, that's never happened. Uh, 
So I guess that's true love. <laughs> I don't know. That is so true that, that with what you said about our personalities, everybody needs a Mary. I, be, I believe that. Yeah. Well, yeah, you do. And believe me, she helps me every well, day. from buttoning my cuffs this morning. Yeah, he couldn't button his cuff. Well, but I want to tell you also about, about um, the last thing that he told me after he told me all this other stuff. Then he started seeing patients oh, after yeah. he graduated from medical school he started seeing patients and he would see him in his office and he would say to the to them this is how i want you to eat to get your health back if you want to get off your blood pressure pills you want to get rid of your diabetes you want to you know you know get rid of your heart problems you have to eat this way and they would say well what am i gonna where am i gonna find recipes that i can eat this way or what am i gonna do and so John came home and he said, you know what, Mary, you really have to invent recipes because I don't have anything to give to my people to tell them what to eat. So the next six months, probably, I spent every single moment in the kitchen developing fairly easy recipes because I, I couldn't cook difficult things. And, uh, I, I had oh, maybe, maybe 20 that I thought, oh, these are pretty good. And John liked them too. And so, you know, it, we so had, we typed them out yeah. and we copied them. Remember the old, no, you probably don't. A lot of people don't. The old mimeograph machines, they're, uh, know, On a manual IBM typewriter, by the way. Yeah. And so, and we and he would pass those out in the office, and uh, he, that's what people got in the beginning, and that's how they learned how to. Do you think you could hop up and grab that book? Oh, I can't. Okay, and then we put them together. We put it together as this book, which was, oh, I don't know, we lost almost all copies in the fire, but somebody was kind enough to give us one. And we we actually have the first cookbook we put together. So. Uh, right. So here here we go. This is. You see, I, I called the book Making the Change. I didn't call it Heal and Stay Healthy or Dr. McDougall's Super Plan for Getting Skinny and Healthy. I called it Making the Change because AJ, I realized back then the problem would be getting people to change. And so here we are, you know, half a century later, or at least 40 years, 40 plus years, uh, still with the uh, goal of helping people make the change. So we've done things like uh, you know, the well, story. Yeah, I want to show them this too. You see how, um, well, you probably can't. Um, this, because this one is, a, um, has mostly uh, tan pages, and so you can see how they were typed up like this. And then as I would invent new recipes, we would pass them out and they could put them in two little clips and they could add them to their book. And by the time we were finished, um, the book was probably twice as thick as it is. And then from there, we went to um, printing copies. Printing, printing copies yeah. yeah, for a regular printer and then publishers and so on. But you know, I just want you to focus your attention on what we focused our attention on. And that is, I knew, and Mary knew how to cook for people back more than 40 years ago. We really haven't changed much in the last 40 years, as far as our recommendations of food or what diseases would be prevented or cured. Right. Now, I've, I've learned so little over the last 45 years. But what I've really learned is, is, and I'm still learning, are ways to help people make the change. And so we would start out with you know, our classroom experience. We actually had in our office, we had a, a, an education room yeah. in our doctor's office. So we had dual slide projectors run by a, a tape whatever they call it, those tapes, cassette, cassette tape, yeah. and it would play two projectors. And we we're so proud of this in an audio and people would watch this uh, one hour presentation. And when, well, no, I was there. Oh, you did. I, I did the changing and I talked. Well, but then I got a little machine to do it. Oh, okay. <laughs> we may have done it initially. But people would come out of that uh, education room sometimes and they would say, I don't like any of those foods. And, you know, Mary, of course, should have gotten upset. She should have been offended. And I was offended until I figured out what to say to these people is, of course, you don't like any of these foods. If you did, you wouldn't be in my office. 
So, you know, the point being is those who have the most difficult time liking the foods likely have the worst diet, likely will have the most difficult time changing, and likely will get the most benefits, undoubtedly will get the most benefits. So if you're having a hard time getting started, hey, you know, we're there to help you. So we went from the office education experience to the community where we gave lectures throughout Honolulu. People still contact me. In fact, this is one of the greatest joys in my life when I get an email from somebody and they say, 40 years ago, I heard you at St. Saint, uh, Francis Hospital, which we do that in Honolulu, give a lecture. And I changed my diet then. I want you to know, here we are 45, 40 years later, and I'm fully active, playing with the grandkids, still working, having a great time, whereas my friends are disabled. They have parking stickers, disability parking stickers. They're in nursing homes or they're dead. I feel like we've done our job, not getting people to change over you know, a day or a week or a month, but over a lifetime. So our efforts have been to get people to make changes. Well, the next thing that we did was uh, uh, we left Honolulu, which is a whole story in itself. We left Honolulu, I uh, was offered a job at St. Louis Hospital in the Napa Valley, California, which was the second leading heart hospital in California at that time. And there we ran the uh, 12-day McDougal program. Here I could lock people up. Uh, I had a whole medical staff, very respected hospital to help take care of them. And uh, there I stayed for 16 years. But our attendance was terrible. And I couldn't figure out why. I've been, I think the reason why, now I think the reason why as well is very, very expensive. Second of all is people associated hospitals as places where people go when they're sick. And they didn't want to be thought of as a sick person. Well, we left uh, in 2002, we left St. Helena and we moved to Santa Rosa where we started running the program in a resort. Our mm -hmm. census tripled in a matter of just a couple of programs and uh, St. Helena has never recovered. <laughs> they, they've tried to run the Google type programs many times since and they've all been failures. So <clears throat> we have run the program up until uh, what was it, 2017? Did we have to, no, no, no just recently. January of 2001. Oh, yeah, we had one after. Sure. Yeah, we started, we ran programs until the pandemic hit. And then, yeah. of course, we got shut down like everybody else. We basically had to go out of business. Well, well that, you couldn't have all those people there, so there was no... Yeah, the, whole, the was resort no was closed. Yeah. The, the airlines were closed. Nobody wanted to travel. It was just a perfect setup for causing us to take the next step. Yeah. And I sincerely mean this. I have been looking forward to taking this step for <laughs> decades. I always understood that it would be difficult to get all these people to come to me, that I had to get to them. And that's why we have the 12 day McDougal program that's run by telemedicine, real doctors, board certified doctors, and teleeducation. That's very personal. And uh, I have to mention the August 21st program is more than sold out. Uh, uh, yeah, August 21st. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're oversold. Oversold. <laughs> So uh, we're still taking reservations for September, but that'll be sold out, if I'm sure, by the end of the week. Yeah. yeah. And then, I don't know when the next one's going to be, but no. well, well, we, uh, we, have we, a can run, we can run them more often than we used to be able to because it, it, we don't have to get all the stuff ready. With the, we don't have to arrange for hotel rooms and make sure everything's empty. We don't have to make copies of everything and pass right. them out. And Everything's by internet. Yeah. So it's easier for us, it's easier for you, because you can schedule it according to your schedule. Let, let me tell you how acceptable this has been, an example. Uh, our, our switch from traveling to us, staying for 10 days, uh, the inconvenience, leaving your work, and so on. We used to take about 100 to 140 people for each uh, business program. Uh, we run we run programs for companies like Whole Foods and CenturyLink. Well, CenturyLink is so excited about what we're doing that they've doubled the number of programs that they have uh, they've signed contracts with us to do. So we'll be and, and they have they really have the idea that they may put a large large number of their, their employees. CenturyLink is a big telecommunication company particularly here in the Northwest. I think they're also in the Southeast. But CenturyLink Telecommunication Company. So they, when they heard about what we're doing in terms of telemedicine, teleeducation, they thought, wow, 
cut the cost <laughs> of virtually nothing. A lot less than we're paying for people who run programs to tell our employees to feel better <laughs> or to think good thoughts or whatever, you know, those, those uh, uh, human resource programs that they hire yeah. at, very, at great yeah. expense. Here people get medical care, ongoing medical care, education. They don't have to miss work. They don't have to travel. They don't have to expense. So companies have been really excited about this, which has been the other area that I've tried to, uh, to build business is with companies like Whole Foods and Century Link and public supermarkets we've done and Blue Cross Blue Shield we've done in the past. So we've done quite a few businesses with great success in terms of their healthcare costs. Uh, Dr. McDougall, there's a question from Anita. Can, can, can people in, in other countries sign up like in oh, Europe? Yeah. Absolutely. It's not a problem at all. We might run into problems. No, I don't think so. Uh, no, I don't. We don't plan on any, any difficulties at all. Our, our doctors are uh, really excited about telemedicine, and I can't see any reason it would be a problem uh, all over the globe. Nice. All right. Back to Dr. McDougall, Mary. Why did you fall in love with him? Was it his dashing good looks, his scintillating personality, the promise wait, of a bright wait, future? Wait, wait. Dashing good looks. I weighed, I'm, oh, I hate to tell you how much <laughs> I weigh now. Just to say I weighed 70 pounds more than I weigh now when Mary said yes. So it wasn't my dashing good looks. It must have been my winning personality. What do you think? <laughs> well, I saw pictures of you guys when you were younger. You both, I mean, not that you're not good looking now, but very good looking couple. Uh, well, you know, youth is beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Youth is healthy. Health is attractive. Health is attractive. So young people uh, are attractive because they're young and healthy. They're still healthy. As you get older, you get sick. And naturally, because of selection, naturally you repulse other people when you're unattractive. And as you get older, you get more sick and more unattractive in general. It doesn't have to be that way. It certainly hasn't been with you. <laughs> so Mary, everybody wants to know, do you make every single meal for Dr. McDougall or is he ever able to fend for himself? No, you know, um, Why? <laughs> well- I cook Dr. McDougall soups. Yeah, and, and you make sandwiches sometimes. You make sandwiches. Right? The <clears throat> sense of fires. I mean, he he never really cooked at all before the fires in, in 2017. And when we moved to our new place in Portland, um, I guess it's because I don't know the the we have a big great room where the living room and the kitchen are kind of connected. Well, they can see it right here. Yeah, but. The, they can't see the living room. Well, that's well, off that you. side. Where our living area is off this side. Yeah. And and um, I don't know. I, he just wanted to help me. He would see me in there working, and he'd be sitting there um, watching the news or something. And he he would say, "Well, can I help you do something?" And I'd say, "Well, yeah, you can chop the potatoes." So now he's he's learned how to chop potatoes and make sandwiches and um, cook vegetable soups. But, yeah. but not any of the more complex things like nut seed no, or tofu no, burgers, no, things no. that you're still the expert. Uh, falafels. Yeah. Oh, but these are things, by the way, we had over the last week. So I don't want you to think I'm in any way deprived. <laughs> but, but you, even Mary, even though you're an amazing cook with thousands of recipes, you guys eat fairly simply, don't you? Oh, we do. We do. Because um, it's just the two of us. And, and I, don't, I don't feel like I want to make a huge dinner, you know, for the two of us. Um, one of our one of our biggest meals that John and I eat together is I, I love mashed potatoes and gravy and so does he. So I'll make potatoes in my instant pot, and um, and I make gravy the, the creamy golden gravy out of one of, out of the cook out of one of the cookbooks. Yeah, it's in the uh, one. It's in many of the cookbooks and it's online. And then um, I'll have some vegetables with that. And John mashes the potatoes. In the in the instant pot, so there's like another. it takes ten mashes and they're done. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's healthy, and uh, he's a good cleaner upper too. Well, the, the, but you do get a little more complex. We have grandchildren here in Portland, and we visit them. But yeah. I have to tell you, uh, we are completely socially distant. We are completely isolated. So the question came up when I did the interview last time: whether or not we practice hand washing masks. Yeah. Uh, six foot distance, actually more like 16 feet, 
Yes, we do. And to the point where we have basically had to give up any close contact with our children and grandchildren. Right. And so, you know, this has been tough on us too. However, we feel it's safe enough to get in our car and we wear double masks when we ride the elevator downstairs. We get in our car and we drive over to our son's house, uh, which is outside of Portland, and we'll walk around the back of the house to the porch, sit on the porch. I don't know what we're going to do in the winter. <laughs> sit on the porch and we'll have lunch and Mary will make her special dishes. Like she'll make the falafels and the nuts and the burgers and our son makes this wonderful noodle dish. Yeah. And they also make pizzas, they grill on the grill. Uh, you know, as, I, as I'm trying to say to you is, it's been difficult for us too, but we figured out ways not to give up everything. And I'm sure you have too. So, so we have favorites. I make, I make uh, tofu burgers because I don't like any of the ones that they uh, have in the supermarket. We don't eat any of that fake meat stuff. Um, so I'll make tofu burgers, I make falafels. Um, I make, oh, I make a, a jackfruit. Oh, that's good. A barbecue jackfruit, that recipe is in, in, online. Um, and um, so we have that. And I make, um, oh, let's see what else do I make a lot. Do, do you, do you ever lot. batch, do you ever do any batch cooking since it's just two of you now? No, I don't. Well, no, not really. I mean, I'll make enough beans. Um, and we'll have have one one night we'll have them for burritos. The next night we'll have burrito, but we'll have bowls with a whole bunch of stuff on top of them. But um, really, I only cook enough for three three days at a time, if if that. Maybe only two. I probably could do batch cooking, but uh, in my old house I had um, two giant commercial refrigerators. Um, in a different room, and so I could make a whole bunch of stuff and freeze it and have extra. And here I don't have that much room, so I, I really can't batch cook and make a lot. What do you make for Dr. McDougall on his birthday? Cake. <laughs> cake I, we have cakes. You know, we have cakes um, for Mary's and my birthday, for the kids, for the grandkids. And, uh, you know, they're generally healthy cakes. Uh, that's why we make them at home. But they have sugar. They have yeah. soy products. But, you know, hey, it's birthday. Time to have a cake. Yeah, um, but that's, that's about all. Seven birthdays a year. Most. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I don't, we don't, we don't usually eat dessert. We have uh, fruit. We have, well, we have a lot of fruit. They have a lot of fruit up here. And so we, we eat a lot of fruit in season. It really makes a difference um, when you go to the, the farmer's market and you see what's in season and that, that's what you eat. You don't. Well, let me add, I think that one of the favorites for birthday is your lasagna. Yeah. I, I, and, a, and a salad, like a, a, a romaine lettuce salad and yeah, a Caesar salad. Yeah, the Caesar salad dressing. Mm -hmm. that, but I haven't done that um, lately. No, but our, our daughter-in-law our, da our daughter-in-law makes this uh, lasagna. Well, Doctor, and by the way, you know, I hope you guys are getting the gist of things because our whole family eats this way. You know, it's not just Mary and I, it's our all three of our children and all what do we have, seven grandchildren? Mm -hmm. All seven of our grandchildren. This is their diet. So uh, you know, it's it's not and it's not been a matter of force either. This is the way the kids were raised. It's pretty easy for them. Well, well, let me ask you a question about that. But first, I just want to mention that you mentioned Mary's lasagna. And once I had interviewed Dr. Doug Lyle on what his last meal would be if he was going to be executed on death row. And he said, your lasagna. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just so you yeah, know. He, did he add he did chocolate pudding? We used to serve it. <laughs> absolutely. <program> absolutely. <laughs> he so, loves the chocolate pudding. You but, mentioned. Uh, I'm sorry. You mentioned that your whole family what eats. What we ought to do as part of our teleeducation programs, we ought to send people desserts yeah, as send, graduation send gifts. <laughs> well, I actually found your barbecue jackfruit recipe and I posted it in the chat if people would like to check it out. You oh, mentioned okay. your whole family eats this way, but your three children, they weren't, a, they weren't born eating this way. So at some point you had to transition them. Was that a problem for any of your three children? How old were they when Dr. Um, McDougall kept coming home and changing your diet? And, and did they adopt Heather, it right away? Heather was two when we changed. So she really didn't have to learn a whole lot. 
um, because at that time, you know, her favorite foods were um, breast milk. <laughs> breast milk. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sandwiches and um, really simple things, just, just potatoes. And so it really wasn't a big change. Her hat was only one. And so he wasn't eating anything anyway, except maybe some baby cereal and breast milk. And Craig, um, we were already completely changed over by the time Craig was born. And so he didn't have to change at all. Well, let me add uh, something that I think has been helpful for people who deal with families is we never told our kids what they could and couldn't eat. Uh, but we only had healthy things in the home. We gave them a thorough education as to why you should eat well. Things that were important to our children, like constipation, whether they could perform as athletes or not, as they got older, whether or not their complexion was clear or full of acne. So it was a matter of education and making sure always the house was clear, clean. When they went out, if they wanted to have chicken McNuggets or whatever, yeah, we didn't really care. Uh, our job was not to be a policeman outside the home. Now you may feel differently, uh, but, but you also may feel like we did, which is our responsibility is to provide the food and the education. We also used it um, for an educational experience because sometimes they would eat something that um, they didn't get at home and they would say, I don't feel very well. And it would be a good time for us to say, well, why do you think you don't feel very well? What did you have to eat? And so we used that as an educational tool and I think that worked well. Nice. And I think our kids, our older children still do that to our grandchildren. If they go out and eat something that it is not what they eat at home and, and they don't feel well, I can, I can still hear Heather saying to um, our oldest grandson, Jason, well, why do you think you don't feel well? What did you eat? And um, so I think that makes a difference. That's great. So a lot of people watching are saying they do what's the, what you call Mary's Mini, that they're having great success. How did you develop Mary's Mini, Mary? Well, well, that was another one of John's ideas. He thought if we can make it really simple for people, then um, well, we can get more people to do it. So he came home and he said, Mary, we have to develop a really simple recipe, a recipe plan that People can, I can just tell people what, what they can eat and what they can't eat and they don't even need a recipe. So he said, what we'll do is we'll, we'll take, we'll choose one starch and that will be our whole starch for 10 days. That's all the starch we'll eat. And then we can add green and yellow vegetables and, and then a few condiments to it. But mainly it will be that starch is what we will live on. Maybe some fruit. Well, but, and so, um, we started out with potatoes because that was John's favorite. So I would make hash brown potatoes in the morning, lots of them. And I would make uh, maybe uh, baked potatoes for lunch and mashed potatoes for dinner. And we'd do the same thing again, only maybe in reverse. And for 10 days, all we ate was potatoes and greens. So well, AJ, came out of people's request for a diet. People keep trying to put us in the category of a diet rather than a lifestyle change or, you know, a, a change that's going to make permanently. They want something quick and uh, and uh, surefire that will guarantee that they can get out of their bypass surgery in a matter of a few days. They can guarantee that they can fit into their tight bathing suits by summertime. You know, people want a diet. Well, and it's described as a diet. It's a diet, man. Yeah. Many diet, and and it was, it was based around starch because starch is the only thing that really makes you feel full. And when you're on a diet, the main complaint is I'm hungry all the time. So if we, we figured if we had enough starch in the in the diet, then um, they would be full and they wouldn't complain about being hungry, and it would work. Plus, variety causes people to eat more. So making it such a, a mono diet, naturally people will select about you know, two-thirds of the calories they otherwise select. I love that what you said, Mary, that starch is the only thing that makes people feel full. Yet even people watching today, people are still afraid to eat potatoes, rice, and beans. Yeah. Well, you know, once they get it, they get freedom. They get control. 
until you understand the uh, importance of starch in the human diet, that we're starch eaters, starch vegetarians, starch avoiders, you're, you're at the mercy of ignorance. Yeah. And uh, once you figure that out, uh, then you have complete control. We have, this is kind of a little off the subject, but it still has to do with starches. We, we have supplied ourselves with extra food um, because of the virus. And I have most of my foods that I have bought are starches. I have lots of dehydrated potatoes. I have tons and tons of beans. I have lots of rice. Um, I bought polenta. Um, any kind of grain that you can think of, I, I have stored in my um, emergency food supply. And so it's mostly starch. And then we'll have some frozen vegetables or whatever we can find to go with it. And, and I do want to mention, you know, we put together this stock of uh, food supply when the pandemic hit. And when we did our first videos, which were about five months ago, they're on our website, com, <clears throat> And we put that together and stuck it back in the storage room. Well, this week we went through and we cleaned out the storage room. Well, Mary's been kind of dipping into different starchy bins <laughs> along the way. And so, how, I don't know, you ordered what? I ordered a whole bunch more starch last week to, to fill up my bins again. A five-gallon bucket? What are they? The five-gallon buckets? I don't know. They're oh, great yeah, big they're huge, huge buckets. Huge. Yeah, I think they're five-gallon buckets yeah. of beans and potatoes. Yeah, yours, yeah. And, um, so we're, we're, we're stocked up. Bye. I got a 25-pound bag of rice. This, of course, fits in with the question people asked me last time. Do I think this is going to end soon? And the answer is no. Do I think they're going to have a vaccine, even though I would really love them to have a vaccine? Do I think they're going to have an effective, safe vaccine soon? The answer is no. If you listen to the experts, they'll tell you basically the same thing. I mean, they may give you some happy news. Nobody wants to be pessimistic about this. I think that's why people are holding out to the salvation of a vaccine that we're going to go back to the way things were. We're never going to go back to things the way we were. You know, even if we do have an effective vaccine, it's never going to be the same. So, you know, it's, it's, it's time to adjust. I'm just going to add one more thing. And I want you to finish this interview off with Mary. No. <laughs> and that is that, you know, the evidence that we have presented that, in fact, on the last show we did together, AJ, uh, the evidence is absolutely uncontestable that people who eat like we do fare better if they catch the COVID-19 disease, if they catch the, the virus. Uh, people will do much better. Those who progress to hospitalization, the need for a mechanical ventilator, and death. I mean, they have as, as much as 12 times the risk of the average population. And you carry that back to us, which were even healthier than the average population. What you find is that you have basically two ways to save yourself from this virus. And that is social distancing, which I absolutely agree with. And number two, to get yourself as healthy as possible. I even sent you and made available for you, if you subscribe to the newsletter, subscribe to the newsletter, I even sent you an article that shows that cholesterol acts as a bridge in the artery walls to allow the virus to get from the bloodstream into your lungs. This is all worked out, folks. Uh, and uh, it's just that, you know, I mean, how often do people recommend that you eat a good diet for a good bowel movement or to prevent heart disease? To take the step to recommend a good diet for a virus is, you know, don't expect that for a long time. <laughs> no. They tell you what the problem is, just like they tell you constipation through your diet or heart disease due to cholesterol and eating meat, et cetera. But they don't give you the solution. Right now, they're telling you if you are overweight, if you have high cholesterol, heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, you're in big trouble, big, big trouble. Well, we know how to get you out of trouble almost overnight. Yeah. Yeah. So... So Mary, we have a few cooking questions if you have time for them. And okay, people said, oh, God, I wish Mary would do a cooking demo and show us how to make Kofu. But basically people want to know what your favorites are, Mary, what your favorite kitchen appliance is, what your favorite knife is, your favorite pan, your favorite spice. So anything you can do to just tell us a little bit about what goes on in your kitchen. You know, um, you see the pot rack up there? They can't, well, they can't really see it. See, you see it's hanging right up at the top of the picture. I we see one of the my, pots, yep. I hung all my pots up there um, because I didn't have room to put them in, in drawers because I like a variety of pots because I, 
sometimes cook a lot of different things. Um, but um, I think our favorite food, if I had to pick one favorite food, it would be potatoes. Um, and, and I also like beans because I, I really like, and I know everybody loves instant cookers and I know that they now are instant cookers that are pressure cookers and slow cookers, but I have an old slow cooker. Well, it's not that old anymore, but I bought it when it got we burned up in got the fire. burned up in the fire. But it, everything got burned up in the fire. It's old to me, it's three years old. Um, and uh, so I really like to cook beans. I'll just put beans on in the morning, just any kind of bean. And then during the day, I'll decide, well, what am I gonna have with it? And I'll add, you know, tomatoes and different kinds of greens and some different spices. And then we'll probably eat it over potatoes. And uh, that way I can change it, but it's still basically the same and it's really easy. And um, so I make a lot of that. And we eat that as a lot of leftovers too. Leftovers are, are a pretty big. Thing. You asked about you know, cooking dishes and storing them away. We really don't do that. We don't freeze things. But no. what is cooked one evening or one afternoon is often two or three days of eating. Lunch. You know, lunch. Or lunch. Yeah. Or sometimes I, yeah. I, we have it again for dinner. You know, the food is so good uh, that you know, we don't have any problem with monotony at all. Yeah, let's see my favorite. So my favorite, uh, my favorite knives are global. I really like global and I also like shin. Um, they're, they're sharp, they, they retain their sharpness. And so I really like those. You can see them in, sitting in a, in a container back there. Um, let's see my favorite, if I had to choose I, I probably would have to choose my instant pot because I could use that for um, slow cooking and for instant pot cooking. And you can make all kinds of stuff in there, rice, rice and everything else. So if I had to choose one pot, that would be it. Um, I do use um, nonstick cookware because I find that um, things don't stick to it. What kind of use? So I use um, scan pan, ceramic, ceramic, yeah. ceramic cookware, scan pan. Um, but there are other ceramic cookwares out there now that um, as long as it doesn't have um, Teflon or Silverstone or those kind of things, it's, it's, uh, it's made with ceramic. Um, I think those are safe. What's your favorite spice? Oh, salt. <laughs> No, let me get that. Let me get it out of the cup. Salt. That's so funny, Dr. McDougal. That's your favorite spice. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no. I, I actually don't like salt very much. I, I, if anything, I'll complain about too much salt in the food. But of course, it's been, been a change that's taken place over years. And uh, so, no, salt is not my favorite. So, and nor does Mary eat much salt. See that? Can you see? Yeah, that's, that's the one from Costco, Kirkland's. Yeah. But you know, it's so funny, it's called, it's called organic no salt seasoning and then I add it to everything. And you can get it at Costco, but one day, like four years ago, when we were still going to Costco, um, I went there and they didn't have it. And I was so upset. So I decided, well, I'll check on Amazon. Guess what? They sell it on Amazon. Sell everything on Amazon. They sell everything on Amazon. So I buy it. You buy two two jars like this, and this lasts me, oh, maybe a couple months, because I dumped quite a bit of this in. There's 21 seasonings in this, and so if I had to choose one spice, this would be it. Does it bother either of you when people tell you you're too thin? Maybe they don't say it to your face, but. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think you're more sensitive to it than we are. Uh, we've gone from a, a, a situation where people usually particularly me, well, Mary went through a phase two also where we were considered overweight. And I think we were, even uh, particularly for people who professed good eating. And this was maybe 30, 35 years ago. Yeah. And the reason was, is we were traveling a lot. We were doing shows all over the country. Uh, Larry King, uh, anyway, lots of different shows. And we probably ate more desserts than we did. Yeah, we probably ate more desserts. And there, there was other things going on in our lives that, caused us to be a little heavy. I would rather be criticized for being too thin 
than being overweight, particularly as a, quote, healthy doctor. Uh, AJ, uh, people who meet you new think you look fantastic. It's people who have an image of you from before being overweight that find you threatening and find it uncomfortable. People like to see the same thing in people. And so they, with sour grapes, come back to you and they think, <laughs> well, maybe she has AIDS or maybe she has cancer. Uh, it's it just the previous conceptions people have. It's just like once upon a time, fat babies were considered healthy babies. Yeah. But of course, fat babies were dying of an increase, you know, all kinds of problems. And uh, that's because prior to that, thin babies were unhealthy because there wasn't enough food available. So you develop these biases. AJ, I'd ask you to just set it aside and just say thank you. I'm glad you look so good, so healthy, and I wish I was as thin as you were because these people know how to fatten themselves up. You don't have to worry about that, AJ. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. I could talk to you guys all day and I hope you'll come back and maybe even cook a recipe. So last question is what's, what's the best advice you can give on people about making the change? Because even, even watching the chat, people are like, oh, I can't eat starch. I'm diabetic and all this, you know, it's just, it just doesn't matter how much we do these broadcasts. People still are afraid. Well, it's called making the change, AJ. You know, just like I showed you the first book we made, we put together, it's called making the change. That's the difficult part. How you cause people to do things that they themselves know they should do. It's like you know people who drink or smoke or take heroin or whatever. They know that they should, uh, but they just need, need the help. Uh, and what we tried to do is offer help to people. I would encourage you to keep at it. I would encourage you to treat every quote failure as a learning experience and just try harder next time. Uh, well, and I think that's one of the reasons that we that we developed the Mary's mini diet is because most people at least like one starch, whether it's rice or beans or potatoes. And if they just concentrate on that one starch and make make some things with that one starch, then they'll find that they can branch out because they'll have learned new taste because it takes a while to learn new tastes. Yeah, and it, to like new things. I just thought, uh, I thought I maybe shouldn't say this, but one of the tricks that I get to get people to make the change is I send them off to True North and where <laughs> they only get water. And after after a week or a month of only water, boy, does our food taste no, good. It tastes really good. So there have been maybe when, you know, when I was in practice, uh, seeing people at, uh, in Santa Rosa, and I saw everybody. I was the doctor when I was in Santa Rosa. Uh, maybe two or three times a year, I'd get either somebody who uh, on rare occasions didn't respond completely to the dietary regime that we put them on. And I gave them one last chance, like with autoimmune diseases occasionally. I, I'd uh, stick them with Alan Goldhammer for uh, a week or a month, and they would be on the ultimate elimination diet. Or the other thing is I'd run into really stubborn people who no matter how convincing I was, and no matter how much they say they were convinced, they just wouldn't do it. And so I sent them over to Alan's place, and Alan worked them over for, that's, that's the true north. <laughs> Alan worked them over for a while, and uh, then they were more compliant. I'm sure he would love to hear the true north is the oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's yeah. a great place for very desperate people, but I think we have a simpler, uh, more long-lasting answer. Absolutely. Well, you, thank you guys so much. I will talk to you anytime either or both of you are available. Dr. McDougal, thank you for making starches great again, making it safe to eat potatoes and Mary for making it so delicious. Thank you, oh, thank you Mary. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Thank you for a half a century. A really good fun. Absolutely. Couldn't, couldn't get yeah, with, without Mary. I don't know, Dr. McDougal. I don't know if you would have been so successful I without Mary. I, I look at my life as uh, one opportunity after the next. I, I've been very fortunate. Even the fire that we went through yeah. three years ago. We wouldn't be here in Portland. We wouldn't have started the telemedicine business. You know, somehow I feel like, a, like I have a guiding hand that seems to take care of Mary and I, and I hope that continues. Uh, but um, anyway, we, we've had a good time. We've made a lot of progress. And in our mid-70s, we're really enjoying life. And we oh, hope that you continue <laughs> to bring these kind of uh, informational opportunities to your people. Yeah, AJ. I just think we're starting a whole new business at, in, in our 70s. Yeah. And by the way, Mary's older than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm older than Charles, too. She's not looking, but she's older than I am. 
Oh, that's great. Well, we love you both. And thank you so much for the work you do, because it's really on your shoulders that we all stand. Well, AJ, you, uh, you know, I would, it would be right for me to leave our broadcast without, you know, you, you've mentioned that we do, you know, at any, at any time it, with your request, we do broadcast with you. And of course, our relationship started out, you know, not knowing each other very well. But over the years, it's been over a decade now that we've become friends. We've had a growing relationship. Well, I have such great respect for you, AJ. You're one person who tells the truth. You stand up for the truth. You're not swayed. And you smile all the way through it. <laughs> you're kind of like, yeah, well. Thank like, you guys well. so much. This has just been such a wonderful broadcast. Yeah, you know, you, you bring the message to people in a very important way. And that's why we're so agreeable when it comes to spending time with you. It's fun for us. And you're doing a service that nobody else seems to be doing as well. Well, there's one McDougal I haven't interviewed and he said no, but maybe he'll say yes now. And that is your son, Craig. Oh, I bet he will. Who's that, Craig? Craig. Yeah. Oh, how about Heather? I asked, I actually asked her too. So they both said no, but maybe now that they see you've done it, they'll, uh, you know, they'll they do it. They don't really want to be in the public spotlight. Uh, yeah. Now, Heather is, of course, running the whole program. She sees very much the public spotlight when it comes to administration. She also gives some lectures during the program. Yeah. Uh, my son is a uh, full professor at OHSU. That's the medical school in Portland. And he likes that kind of academia. But he also knows uh, all of the things about good diet because he's worked with us at the clinic. So he's bringing our message to o OHSU. Yeah. And OHSU is starting to realize, too, that whether or not people die of COVID <laughs> depends upon how healthy they are. So they're trying to look at their options. And hopefully some medical school someplace will decide that it would be really good PR to take the stand that they're going to make their patients healthy instead of just drug and surgerized, which is what they're making their money on now. They'll figure out how to make money doing the right thing. I think so. That's great. Well, thank you guys so much. And, and good luck with your first uh, virtual program. And I hope this, there are many more to come that we can get people and involved call, with. And get in touch with us at uh, our website, drmcdougall.com. I know you put it up on your website. But we'd be glad to see you. And, uh, well, uh, we think we've got a real winner here going yeah. forward. And, and you married a real winner, Dr. McDougall. That's really <laughs> good. To, to, <laughs> that's the most important thing. Thanks, AJ. Absolutely. Well, All I, right. <laughs> Take care of you I, guys. I would say, AJ, this is a closing. There was a cosmic event that occurred back uh, in 1971, and that was, there was a collision between two strong personalities, and that was Mary and I. And, right. You know, well, I, I've never heard of anyone proposing in a medical school library, I'll tell you that, that's a first. <laughs> that's new. That's a first. Well, thank but you guys but so- it's perfect for him, don't you think? Yeah, that's where I live. I, yeah. I, basically, I've lived in the medical library for the last half century. That is that my is favorite just, place to be. It's like a candy shop. You can relate to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this has been great. Well, thanks everyone so much for watching and sharing this broadcast. And please come back at 11, the regular time today, when Brittany Giruti will be sharing her 70 pound weight loss story and making vegan charcuterie. Thanks again, Dr. McDougall and Mary. Uh -huh. I really appreciate it. Bye everybody. <laughs>